Milwaukee. And I would like to uh, start by thanking our co-organizers at uh, the university here, our College of Nursing, Center for Global Health Equity, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Zilber School of Public Health, and my own Institute of World Affairs. So sort of the background to our, our program today is, is the life and legacy of Dr. Paul Farmer, who I'm sure uh, you know passed away this past February, a man who was uh, dubbed by one author, the man who would cure the world. And his legacy is uh, a network of organizations, uh, partners in health, whose task it is to bring the benefits of modern medical science to those most in need and to serve as an antidote to despair. In Rwanda, partners in health, and if you'll forgive my, my fractured, Kenya Rwanda is in Shuti Buzema. Perfect. Uh, established, I believe, in 2005. And we are very pleased to have with us the executive director, Dr. Joel Mobiligi, who leads the team of about 200 healthcare professionals in their mission to strengthen the public health system in rural and underserved areas of the country. So uh, before I ask, uh, our speaker to begin his remarks. I'll just uh, remind everyone as to format. We will have a, a, about 20 minutes or so of a formal presentation, and then uh, we can open up the rest of the time, which is about 60 minutes, uh, for questions. I would ask that you remain muted until that time. And also, when you have a question to pose, if you could put it in the text, or, and uh, we will call on you and then you can unmute and pose your question. So with that, I would invite our speaker to begin his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, good morning, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it's my great pleasure and a great honor for me to be here on this platform to share and talk about uh, our work really in a way to honor and commemorate um, the legacy of um, Dr. Paul Farmer that we affectionately call here in Rwanda, uh, Muganga Mwiza, which means the good doctor. So everywhere where he works, he had these names that people call him out of the affection they had um, for him. And I mean, my way to start this, I really want to share some slides with you. And uh, the slides will show you some of the obvious facts that we know about the current business of our world in terms of inequality. Uh, we should look at where the most of people or the population lives in the globe and where most of the resources here in terms of money translated into um, uh, gross domestic product, GDP. And what I like about this format of presentation from the World Map uh, website, it really gives a shape and size of the continent or the countries depending on the studied indicator. So if you look at in terms of population, I'd ask you to pay a, um, attention on the continent of um, Latin America and uh, Africa, their size in terms of share of global GDP and their size in terms of share of population. And when you look at this information that we know and uh, hear often, there is, and that also actually before that, and that actually reflects even in health indicators here, only picking one, which is under five mortality. And you look at Africa, uh, that has the biggest share of under five mortality um, globally. And if you look at um, uh, Central Asia and uh, uh, Southeast Asia. So when we look at this, you know, there is different reaction we can have. One would be to accept it as a, an inescapable fact in reality of life um, that, um, you know, have its roots from individual country choices and so forth. The other one 
could be to try to really understand what is the root cause of these, what are the issues that have been really pushing this level of inequality. And when you go through root calls, you can think about it into geopolitics, history, um, uh, context, contextual uh, uh, situation at the country level, regional and global. But I think the uniqueness of Paul um, is that he looked at all of those factors, but went even deeper to really find the root cause to be really ingrained or rooted into moral, into the, 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 the really understanding that there is this understanding that guide policies, that guide ideology, that guide decision-making, that cause wars, that cause, um, uh, you know, most of the wrong issues going on around the world based on this idea that some lives matters less than others. So he had really that moral clarity that was driving his passion and most of the decision to really try to bring, attempt to bring a cure and a solution to this moral gap and moral problem. And before I continue into what have been some of the work and inspiration from Dr. Paul Farmer, uh, I want to show some examples of things that we have, we, have, we have heard, but we have probably never really looked at it through the lens of this quote from Paul Farmer. Um, and, and I call them ideological barriers because, you know, sometimes we tend to justify these moral uh, shortcomings from um, the way decision making and business and affairs have been happening through the world through some statement that may sound justifiable, but actually plainly shows what are the gaps. You know, all of you, most of you would know this famous statement uh, in the in the you know in the height of the HIV pandemic when people were debating if uh, the new life-saving drug um, antiretroviral therapy, if we should fund and provide access to people in low resource income countries, uh, namely in Africa, and people who have some clear reason for why not to do so. And these famous quotes from uh, Andrew Nazio, who in the US Congress is saying basically that, you know, that definitely there is some issues that we cannot that cannot allow us to bring these drugs in Africa, basically because of the ignorance, the, I don't know how, even how to, to label it, you know, you just read at the statement and you're shocked, you know, and he's saying that this sounds small and some people, if you have traveled to rural Africa, you know this, this is not a criticism, not that this is not a criticism, just a different word. People do not know what watches and clocks are. They do not use Western means to, for telling time. They use sun. These drugs have to be administered during a certain sequence of time during the day. And when you say take it at 10 a.m., people will say, what do you mean by 10 a.m.? They do not use those terms in villages to describe time. They describe the morning and the afternoon and the evening. So that is a problem. Basically, that goes, if you look at it through the statement of Paul Farmer of the root cause of all issues, is really that understanding that some life matters less than others. However much you can identify, um, you can justify it ideologically or in um, any way possible, because all of these things are not factual. In fact, we have proved that the rate of acceptance and the rate of um, uh, uh, uptake of antiretroviral therapy in Africa have been among the highest uh, globally. The same thing with treatment of, of um, malaria or second treatment for tuberculosis as uh, 
um, uh, Amir Ataran showed in his 2007 work, you know, the statement saying that the patients, you know, um, you know, the development policymaker have also freely opened that Africa could not manage to take atomicin based combination therapy. As more justifications have been happening there. Here I'm talking really about, about, um, about infectious disease, but even non-communicable diseases, even access to service to surgery. This is Adela Mahler, who has been uh, the WHO Secretary General um, in the early 70s, and I've been one of the champion of the, um, uh, the Amaata Declaration um, of Universal health, uh, uh, Healthcare Access. In, two, in 1980s, made this statement about surgery. Surgery is clearly, has clearly a role to play in primary healthcare. Without surgery, in spite of preventive measures, people will not have faith in primary health care. This may seem kindergarten information coming from the Director General of WHO. Yet, although these are high priority matters for everybody, the vast majority of the world population has no access whatsoever to skilled surgical care and little is being done to find a solution. So for him and for most of the people, and I think most of the people even in this conversation will agree with me of the central importance of surgical care in healthcare access. And this is 1980 statement by the WHO um, Director General. But look at the data in 2015 in terms of percentage of access. Um, the blue, the darker blue is between 80 to 100% um, of population without access to surgery. And uh, the lighter, uh, orange uh, color would be between zero to 20% of people really going without access to surgery. And for Paul Farmer, that's the root of it really goes back to how do we really look at um, um, human being and human life and human rights in terms of health access, you know? And other people have really tried to find out what have been the problem with this, it is clearly that those ideological issues and gaps uh, can even be market globalization with uh, the idea of privatization of healthcare services that could uh, support building health systems. But very little globally have been really being put into building health systems in these countries. And then Paul asked this question. If access to healthcare is considered a human right, who is considered human enough to have that right? And the COVID period have actually sparked a light into that inequality again and again and again. Uh, you know, from vaccine holds, from um, rich countries, from argument of lack of refrigerators in Africa, similar argument that what we read from Nazio and others um, that have been going on and on again. But I think the problem have been what is our urgency to actually act if we take consideration of the dignity and importance of lives that are going, that are dying on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, failure to take that action actually, and that's really the philosophy of Paul Farmer is more costly than the cost we can put into building the right health system, into building the right place infrastructure where people will be trained and, and uh, building the human resources that are needed in those countries, strengthening the health system. And that's have been the focus of the work. It was not only finding the root cause where it is in terms of the moral call for the organization, but also taking action, taking action in preventing, in providing, um, you know, in giving decent provision for the poor. And that's what the work that has been happening in Haiti, that's the work that has been happening in Rwanda, in many other countries uh, around the globe. This beautiful facility here is the um, Mirbale University uh, Hospital that uh, opened in 2013 
in Haiti a few years after the first tragic earthquake. Um, and at that time, you can imagine the, the resources that were poured through multiple NGOs in uh, Haiti, but none of it really went into building a proper health system for the country. And with that principle of really bringing decent provision for the poor, we took on this big project, uh, building this tertiary facility, not only in order to provide high quality care, but also to be a center for teaching, for training the next generation of Haitian. Um, in the first earthquake, the place was poured with um, uh, flying doctors and people from many places. But by the time of the creation of this hospital, um, by 2020, there were close to 200 resident who had graduated from uh, there uh, in family medicine, pediatrics, emergency care, internal medicine, obstetrics, surgery. And in last year, earthquake, um, close to 90% of those people who graduated from the residency program in this hospital stayed in Haiti. And they were among the first emergency team to go and support during the last year earthquake in Haiti. And, you know, the same vision is calling us about the work that we're going to do in, um, in uh, Sierra Leone with bringing in a maternal child health center of excellence. We know, you know, Sierra Leone is um, one of the country with the poorest maternal health outcome. You know, it is estimated like one in 20 women in Sierra Leone um, had a lifetime risk of death related to pregnancy and childbirth. And the biggest gap is really human resource, midwives, um, OBGYN, general practitioners, and so forth. So partners in health and the government and different partners, are, we're engaging into this similar project that what we did in Haiti, but to bring in this set of excellence, that will be a place to train and, and contribute to building a health system that uh, will support and help achieving reduction on maternal mortality. The same work in terms of training future medical doctors in Rwanda, and not only in Rwanda, because this university, the University of Global Health Equity, is serving currently um, uh, people from different. Uh, we have in our master's program people uh, from other countries, uh, from um, Southern Africa, from Malawi, from Kenya, from Uganda, and others. And this putting this uh, university in a rural setting, it's also a place to really make sure that these students are trained here, are exposed to the direct health system where they will work later in life, but also bringing in the quality of care and exposing them to social medicine from early in their training. You know, Providing cancer uh, care in a rural place, um, like in Botaro, uh, in one of the districts where we work in Rwanda, and the program that started in 2012, uh, receiving now, for now we have close to 11,000 patients that went through this clinic. We currently have close to five, uh, 4,000 active patients. The majority of them would be women cancer with uh, breast and cervical cancer coming first. And so this place is able to really provide care to these people who otherwise would not have the chance to receive the care that they needed. Another example on how we face problems. So this is just to give an example on when you look at people through a moral lens, when you look at problems through a moral lens, there is no way you can stay, you know, passive or just accept that as you know an inescapable reality during covid like in rwanda like in many other places in the world we went through um went through lockdown and patients that come to this center 60 percent of them come from all over the country during lockdown period patient could not move and go to the center and we had patients who had to receive their chemotherapy. Then we sat and tried to think about what do we have to do? 
And here I want to highlight the importance of having a structured health system. In Rwanda, we have close to 40 district hospitals. We have close to 500 health centers across the country, well decentralized health system. We have informatic system where we have in our data, the name of our patient, the type of cancer, the address and what drug they need to receive and what they need, when they need to receive it. It was easy for us in two days to identify which patient needs their treatment urgently, where do they stay, contact the closest health center, work with a blood supply um, uh, uh, through drones uh, company and use their drones to drop the chemotherapy, the oral chemotherapy closer to the patient so that they can receive that drug. For those who need an IV chemotherapy, mobilize vehicles with the University of Global Health Equity, with uh, the Rwanda Biomedical Centers, pick patients at their places, closer to their places, and get them to the facility where they can get that. And we did that for a period of a month and a half. And during that period, we had close to, um, you know, 70,000 oral cancer tablets distributed in 16 districts. So this was a heavy lift for us, but we look at the patients lives that is threatened as our focus. As part of the expansion of our services, we're looking into even broader um, facility where the students that are trained at, the, training, trained at the university can receive the proper medical training. So we really want to not only increase the quantity of healthcare providers, but also their quality with proper distant place where modern medicine is taught to them and uh, also patient receive that modern care. And as I conclude, you know, people will always come with questions that usually will be backed with the ideology problem that I mentioned at the beginning in terms of sustainability, in terms of cost effectiveness, but everything you are able to do are really based into the proper partnership, partnership with the government, partnership with people who believe in the mission and the impact of it actually is much bigger and the cost of not doing what we are doing would have been tragically high. So with that, I conclude my introductory uh, remark and I thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, as I invite people to, to pose questions and we'll get to those in just a second, you could, you could spend a, a, just a few minutes talking a little bit about how the kind of partnership model and sort of systems-based approach that you describe varies from the more typical approach to public health. No, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned, one of the, the quotes were, um, you know, Lombardo and Price trying to think about what have been the cause of this disparity around surgery. And what they really came up to that is really about the usual public health approach that funds allocation and support historically have been really looking into a minimalistic way of looking at it, really in terms of what are the essential medicine, focus on prevention and so forth, which is not bad. But obviously what you realize is that what you need is a system that is able to provide broader service and that is able to provide decentralized um, service to people. So an investment in that long-term um, uh, infrastructure require material input and the material input in our jargon in PIH, we talk about the five A's, the five A's that will be um, space in terms of infrastructure, staff in terms of human resource, staff in terms of um, uh, uh, equipment, social support in terms of really tackling the social determinants of health. So that's, those are the aspects that need to really thought in terms of system building and invested in. So I talked about the example of Rwanda particularly. And in the past, 
a couple of decades rather than investing in this long-term um, health system. And during the COVID time, that's where we actually saw um, in an obvious way, actually even before COVID, I think Rwanda been reducing maternal mortality drastically, I think in a most historical way uh, that it has happened, happened in any other places. But that input, that material input being in place have actually contributed to bigger impact than the usual uh, public health intervention. So we looked at it in terms of human resource, starting by community health workers, nurses, GPs, how do we build, how do we produce, and how do we retain them? Uh, infrastructure, we talked about Rwanda having close to 500 um, health, uh, um, rural clinics and 40 district hospitals. You need to build those, those infrastructure. You need to build a medicine supply system. You need to build a informatic a medical um, informatics system to capture information and inform your decision with data. So that is really the health system strengthening approach that tackle at the same time prevention, but as well care provision in a broader term. Thank you for that. And we've got a, a question. Laura, would you like to unmute and ask your questions? Sure, thank you so much. This was really um, a great, great presentation. Um, so I have two questions and feel free to answer both or either. Um, the first is, can you talk more about the intersections between public health and peace building, um, especially in the context of Rwanda? And um, the second would be about how do you navigate mistrust of the healthcare system in the communities that you serve? Great questions, great questions, uh, Laura. Uh, in your first question, actually, I would like to uh, link it with, uh, you know, the tragic event that we are, we experienced here in Rwanda um, with the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda that took up, you know, million of our population lives here and destroyed completely the country and really put the country in a position of being a failed nation. And I think at that time on, really tackling unity and reconciliation in a country like that, considered highly tackling social disparity, considered highly tackling basic human rights, like access to food, to health, to education, and so forth, really looking into social well-being. And you cannot do so a, an environment where conflict is active, an environment where there is harm and revenge and continuous cycle, uh, that toxic con continuous cycle of um, conflict. So it was really a lot of effort to act in building justice system, a lot of effort to act in building an understanding and approach that forgiveness is a must and is something that will allow us to move forward. A lot of effort to really have the weakest in our population, the poorest in our population at the center of policy making and decision making. And I think, I do believe that those are the things that have really driven some of the decision, even in building the health system. Currently in Rwanda, um, there is close to 60,000 community health workers based at each village in the country who are able to diagnose and treat malaria, who are able to um, um, uh, identify risky pregnancy and refer to health facility and so forth. Really for the public fund, the public system, the government to invest in that, there's that strong commitment in really um, uh, investing in social welfare as a way to build peace, as a way to create a more equal uh, society and as a way, and, and that 
vice versa have an impact and health outcome that I just demonstrated earlier at what is happening in Rwanda. So I truly believe peace, security, peace building cannot go separate by with social welfare, cannot go separate with um, building more or increasingly equal um, uh, society. And, and on your um, second question, um, I think really the issue that we have been facing and, um, and, 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 and tackling here is that we definitely need to look at it as well in a way that, uh, you know, this is not, not only a national or local um, issue, but it's also affect global. I just showed at the beginning in my introduction the difference and disparity in, you know, um, population distribution, income distribution, health outcome um, uh, uh, distribution, and the issue that really is based really back again into, you know, that quote that I shared from Paul Farmer, what, you know, if there's a life that matters more than the other, um, or if really uh, access to health is human right, and uh, you know, who should we consider as human enough to have that right? And look that on that humanity really in a global way, not looking at that humanity divided by geography or divided by national borders, but how do we really, as a global society, share that responsibility? And that goes even far beyond issues that we have been talking recently about, um, you know, global warming, um, about how how people are failing to make the right decisions. Um, about uh, market globalization and the issues that, are, that, that we are facing. You saw the issue of how people are failing even to, uh, you know, to remove the patent right for vaccine to make sure that it's accessible and available to everyone. So those to me are the issues that, you know, Paul saw with clarity and have been a forefront fighter, not only through his book, not only through his uh, uh, you know, philosophy and understanding, but also actions, as I just showed earlier with the different examples in Haiti, Sierra Leone, and, and Rwanda. I don't know if I answered your question, Laura. Diego, Morico Zaitane. Morico Great. Uh, well, we have some more questions. We'll, we'll get to, I think, probably everyone. And if you'd like to uh, ask your question, and then uh, Christine will be next. Thank you for so much for your talk and the work that you're doing. And you already started talking about some of this in your response to the previous questions. But I was just wondering if you could say a little more about how the UN Sustainable Development Goals guide your work and work in Rwanda in general. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, 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 the SDGs, um, you know, guide our work in many ways. I think, I think the SDGs, first of all, take its um, put source of inspiration really from what have been there since the Alma Ata declaration about uh, UHC, Universal Health Care Access. And I just quoted uh, earlier um, uh, Mahler, who was a uh, director general of WHO, uh, who led the work around Alma Ata. But from that time of that declaration to, you know, recent history, there have been really little in terms of that was really done in terms of reaching this universal health coverage access. The best that were closer to that was with the MDGs um, and also with, you know, historical funds mobilization around PEPFAR and Global Fund that were mobilized around uh, HIV AIDS and tuberculosis and malaria. But that have been really pushed a lot of the achievement to the goals. But then we realized that there is also issues around those MDGs. They were sometimes a little bit narrowed, focused on a specific disease, 
did not tackle the broader issues, the social determinants of health, uh, and was sometimes not even ambitious enough. So then we move as a new goal around the SDGs. But unfortunately, one of the issues with the SDGs, I think some of the funds mobilization that accompanied the MDGs um, are, were not coming through that. So I think one of the biggest issues that we have now is not only have these ambitious goals, great goals that can really spark, um, uh, uh, motivate engagement for people, uh, but need also to be a little bit more practical on what fund we put there and how do we deal with that. And that's where I think our approach on the app of the five cases that I just mentioned in terms of space, staff, 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 and social um, uh, uh, support, really look at those aspects. You know, what are the material gap? What are the systemic gap? And what are the social gap? And how do we invest into building that? And when you do that properly, that actually where you reach again, um, some of the goals around the SDGs. So I've been looking in area that have been neglected for many years of the MDGs like surgery. I've been looking in area that have been neglected for many years, like NCDs, like cancer, and try to see how do we develop programs and integrate them within the public health system and make a proof of concept that this can work and this can happen. That's why we're treating cancer in a place like in rural Butaro. That's why we're being uh, decentralizing NCD care into health center level, decentralizing mental health care into health center level and community level, and work with that in partnership with with uh, the government that that kind of work is integrated and with taking ambitious tasks like that. That's how we closely, in a practical way, makes closer step toward the, the SDGs. Well, thank you. And uh, Christine, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question, and Cynthia will be uh, waiting on deck. Thanks, Doug. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, great. Thanks. I, t I have COVID um, right now, so please excuse uh, my voice. Um, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for coming today to um, give this really important talk. I just have a couple of comments that I'd like to make. I'm a medical anthropologist at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, and I've been here for 15 years. And so as a medical anthropologist, I've been teaching about Dr. Farmer's work to all of my students um, every year in the, in the classes that I teach and the work that I do. And I think it's so important to, um, to talk about the, the work that you're doing in Rwanda and also sort of taking the lessons that you've learned and applying them here in the United States because what the pandemic has shown my students and I in the, in the classes that I teach is that um, the intersections of human rights like food security and housing security and healthcare security is so important. And, and during this pandemic, it's shown my students and I just how you know, structural violence occurs to the most vulnerable of us, no matter where we are in the world, right? Whether we're in Rwanda or we're in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I was so struck and so pleased to hear you say that in the, in the medical training that you have for students all over the world, whether it's in Haiti or Rwanda, that you're including social medicine as sort of a, as an important, not like, not like an add, you know, an add and stir approach, but as an integral part to how you're training your medical students. Because I think that a lot of times we have a, a real sense of biological reductionism around the world whereby you know, teaching medicine means that we're teaching about just the anatomical parts of the body or just, you know, sort of the, the technology that's necessary or needed. But instead, I think that what we all see right now during the pandemic is that we need to understand the cultural and the economic and the political implications of the work that we do all over the world. So we need to understand that inequality no matter where it is, really affects all of us everywhere. And so I really appreciate those two important things that I took away from your talk. And I want you to know that, you know, I'm putting up the good fight and I'm, I'm teaching my, my undergrad students at home to, to hear this message. And so that when they go on and do the work that they do, no matter where they are in the world, they'll continue the work of um, Paul Farmer, no matter where they are. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. And, and, and you are right on, 
on point on your on your comment and addition. And and another example that I wanted to use just to add on that is uh, with COVID. You know, and and I think most of it also comes from the experience in Rwanda because we really experienced the most horrible thing um, in 1994 and uh, really went, I don't know, I don't think we could go lower than that um, as a nation and as yes. people that uh, we, you know, we didn't have to learn it that hard way, but at least we took our lessons. And I think that have been a, a, a driving, um, uh, you know, energy, a drive and, and motivation to really make the right thing in terms of policy decision and system building decision. And uh, as I say, during the COVID, uh, during the, the lockdowns, I think if we did not have health centers that are closer to the people, if we did not have community health workers, we have been calling community health workers in places that are three, four hours driving far from our supply of chemotherapy and work with a, a, a drone distributor company to send chemotherapy and have the community health workers pick them and distribute them to the patients. You cannot do that if you don't have that system. You know, we, 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 we work, and that's actually what actually been led by the government, um, you know, asking people to stay at home, but you cannot ask people to stay at home if they don't have food. You know, and we really, I mean, and that was clear. For, there were no, there were no debate around that in the government. There were not, it was not something to debate on. It was clear. And they had to mobilize a way to actually distribute food to these people to allow them to stay at home. So it's really, and that's, that's what I wanted to block when I was bringing real about the ideological barriers is most of the time those debates are more really um, ideological than rather than factual. Um, yeah, so thank you. I wanted to add those. those. Thank you. Cynthia, you have a question. Yeah, so um, thank you for, for doing this presentation. I've been following Dr. Paul Farmer and PIH for quite some time as probably everyone on this call. <laughs> Um, and I'm an occupational therapist. I work in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And if you know the profession of OT, we, um, we have deep roots in mental health. So I've been following PIH's initiatives around mental health. And, and I said in my comment that I just listened to a podcast about the initiatives in Sierra Leone. I've also traveled back and forth to Haiti and I have OT students there who are working in mental health um, in mental health institutions in the country of Haiti and want to make a difference um, in how mental health is treated and the stigma and all that. And I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to those specific initiatives around mental health and um, modernizing the attitudes and the treatment of people with mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cynthia. So as I, I will assume most of people here would know that, uh, you know, traditional mental health services, especially in context of Africa, um, you know, from the first mental health uh, clinics or hospitals uh, from the, that we inherited uh, from the colonialism and post-colonialism period, was basically a central psychiatric hospital functioning like a prison. And, um, and uh, you know, even sending a patient to that place was coming with its own stigma, um, uh, understandably. So it was clear that with modern understanding of mental health, that we know now that uh, the more service and support someone suffering uh, for mental distress that they receive within their community, the quicker and the better, um, uh, you know, stability they get. But how do we build a health system that provide that level of service in our context? And that was, has been most of, one of the most challenging questions that we had. How do we really um, uh, 
translate the training of nurses, general nurses, general practitioner in understanding mental health and understanding service provision of mental health so that they are comfortable to provide that service. How do we influence policy to uh, identify um, um, basic mental health medicine to be distributed uh, through the whole chain of the health system rather than having them only on that central uh, psychiatric hospital. So those have been the work that we've been doing um, in different places and here in Rwanda as well. And it, to be honest, it has been a tough call because you really need to not only prove that these people can be stabilized and follow on through in their community, but you also need to, you know, fight different stigma, not only from the population and community, but also from the healthcare providers themselves from many years of practice. But through years and consistency and people seeing that actually their patients are getting better, we have been, you know, winning that ground uh, uh, in a way or, in, or, or another and establishing that system. So in some places, it has been more successful in others. And in our context, it has been even more successful because of, as I say, the willingness of the country. We really work with a progressive um, government and health system that have been taking this model and quickly upscaling it into national level service provision, quickly adopting into policies, quickly including mental health medicine into a list of essential medicine to be provided through the primary healthcare system and through the public supply system and so forth. So those have been the wins that we have been um, getting, but the idea was really to make sure that the best knowledge that we have, the best care that we can provide to these, the patients with mental health uh, uh, districts with, within their community is provided through the public health system. The second aspect of it, what I've been challenging, is the link between mental health and social suffering. Social suffering through poverty, social suffering through different aspects. So there is no way we can tackle mental health uh, issues without really providing social support as part of the treatment as well. And this is something we have still been struggling with. Um, global funding mechanism, wherever we provide a proposal to really make sure that we are decentralizing the, these mental health uh, services, we will always hit that wall of including social support as part of that support for these uh, services that is decentralized in the community. But we still believe that, uh, you know, with uh, uh, determination and continue to showcase success of our program, will be able to even you know, uh, reach those um, global support on the model that is being provided. Um, you know, we won that war with, uh, with HIV, with uh, TB, and I'm confident we'll continue to win that with mental health and other NCDs. Well, I would invite uh, anyone else who has a question to, to pose it. And in the meantime, I've got one. One of the issues that I, I think we all face is the, the relative lack of attention span on the, on the part of many elected officials and government generally, given the fact that you know, these kind of entrenched long-term problems really require long-term solutions. How, how do you uh, keep, fo uh, keep people focused on uh, the long game, if you will? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, there is a lot that comes from, I would say, Dr. Paul Farmer Lives himself. I think, you know, recently, uh, in the last month when Paul was here um, in Rwanda before his passing, he was looking after a couple of patients. And uh, those are patients who was really critical in our hospital in Butaro. And one of the patients passed away um, and you could see how devastated Paul was by losing only that one patient. And this is, I mean, this is a 
physician and doctor for you know more than 30 years of experience and you can imagine how many lives have been seen going but that same level of empathy that same level of commitment to try whatever it takes to make sure that that patient receive all the chances to survive all three years was amazing and 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 really speak on who he was and that same level of commitment and level also focusing on what is the solution we need to bring into inequality and i think that level of basic understanding on um, our work is based on empathy and our work is based on, you know, um, uh, making sure that the root cause is always in front of our eyes and tackled first and having bold and ambitious, always bold and ambitious project to put on the table as a contribution to solve that i've been driving i'll put that way for our work uh, here in rwanda in different countries the different uh teams in different countries across the globe of pih have been always been driven by that same um uh, intensity and that same uh focus so i'm not quite sure how to answer that but i think there is clearly a clear focus on our oracle a clear focus that our work is based on empathy for the weakest and the poorest and the sickest among us and to never lose sight of it and always being ambitious on behalf of them. Well, thank you for that. And uh, as, as we conclude our time together, I'm wondering if, uh, if you could just take a few minutes and give us your thoughts on many people uh, on, uh, on our call today are one way or another involved in the provision of health care, but many are not. So uh, just for, for the general population, how can we be partners in health? So, you know, you're here commemorating and thinking about Paul's legacy, and I'll also take some of his quotes or paraphrase and idea, and, you know, there is one time where they asked him in terms of like how, you know, how do you do this that looks like a Sisyphean task? And his point was, we do difficult things with friends. And in this partnership and work, there is, first of all, an understanding that everyone has something to contribute, either an idea or a skill or a resource or a network, an idea that in order for us to really lift the heavy lift, we really need to collaborate and work in an environment where we trust each other and uh, are able to really create that environment where we can give space and allow others to bring the idea and contribute. You know, when I look at this work that I just shared, there is there is civil engineering, there is architects, there is um, drone supply company, there is um, gardeners, there is, uh, there is all different people really are putting their hand, idea, skill to create the right environment for the patient. So my thinking here is on the different people involved here to really look at the things through the lens of the root cause, which is moral, and finding our commitment to contribute, especially from our privilege of our position of privilege. I think for some of us who have the privilege to be educated, to have the privilege to have resources, to have funds, we are even having a greater call to contribute. So there is looking at that in that root cause as moral and understanding for those who are in position of privilege as a call to contribute into that and not neglect what you can contribute and really function uh, in a place where everyone through that partnership bring um, their, their, their singular and unique input. 
Well, that's a, a very good message to send us on our way with. Uh, on behalf of our organizers, I would like to thank you, Dr. Joel. And thank you, thank you for your uh, presentation today, which was certainly inspiring. And thank you for the work that you're doing. And with that, I will uh, let you have your well-deserved rest at the long of, end of what I'm sure was a very long day. And uh, so thank you. We look forward to hearing more from you in the coming days. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for our attention. Bye-bye.